This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe they can be and do anything. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. So, how much do you know about the Mexican-American War? Oh. Um, as in the war over the Western states and all? Yes. Yeah. Oh, a bit. I knew pretty close to nothing yeah. about the Mexican-American <laughs> War. That's not really a common part of our history. Which is ridiculous, because you and I grew up in the part of America that was Mexico until the Mexican-American War. Yeah. And yet I never learned about this in school. Yeah. So I am just going to assume that most of our listeners don't even know what we're talking about. Okay. So first, I'd like to just explain what the Mexican-American War is. Okay. So a lot of America used to be Mexico. Uh huh. <laughs> Until 1848, a big chunk of the Western United States was Mexico. Mm-hmm. Utah, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, all Mexico. And until the Mexican American War, when, you know, you hear about pioneers going off to California, mm-hmm. they were leaving the country and entering another country, maybe illegally. Yeah. To go and try to start a new life. So the way that we think about the whole expansion into the Western United States is much messier. Yeah, we kind of tend to think that it's just this sort of no man's land, sparsely populated. Yeah, there's the occasional tribe of Native Americans. Yeah, but it's not a country. It's just this no man's land waiting to be claimed. Right. But there's no mention. Yeah, there's no Mexico in that story. Yeah. (laughs) I just never was taught that this land was owned by people. Mm -hmm. So the Mexican-American War goes from 1846 to 1848. When the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, the American government makes very specific promises. Okay. We promise all of you who own land in California, you will keep all of your land titles Everything transfers, Mm -hmm. and you will lose nothing if you choose to stay. You may choose to move to what will now be Mexico, but if you choose to stay, everything stays the same. Okay. Knowing what you know about human nature and governments and promises, (laughs) would you have stayed? Oh, man. Um, You don't want to just uproot and move to a totally foreign place but knowing what one knows about human nature and governments i would be loath to trust any kind of promises like that also yeah i think now i definitely you know if a foreign government is saying no we promise everything's going to stay the same yeah i definitely would not Mm. however i think the same narrative that i didn't know keeps feeding back in of well why don't they just move back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is where they've lived for four generations. Yeah. You know, uh, most of us in this time period of America don't have four generations who have lived in one ranch, one area, one home. Mm -hmm. And so I really don't think I can understand that level of attachment and commitment to what do you mean just leave? This is my home. Yeah. Also, they're really wealthy. Most of the people who own land, they're nobility. You're not just saying, well, just leave and go somewhere else. You're saying abandon 10,000 acres of oceanfront land yeah. and move to another place that you haven't been. Yeah. Hmm. So many, many people stayed, including the family of the woman we're talking about today. Hmm. Surprising to maybe no one who knows anything about history that very quickly (laughs) those rights are not respected and none of the land titles transfer and people spend decades fighting for the rights that were guaranteed in this treaty. Mm -hmm. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. So the woman we're talking about today 
is named Maria Ruiz de Burton. And she was the first Mexican-American to publish in English. So to learn about Maria Ruiz de Burton, I talked to Dr. Maria Carla Sanchez. I'm Maria Carla Sanchez. I'm an associate professor of English and of women's studies at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. When I was writing my dissertation, I was trying to just learn everything that I could learn about 19th century women writers, you know, grab books off the shelves of the library. And I found her books, which had just been republished. And I went to talk to one of my advisors. And when I said, I checked out two novels by Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton, he said, who? So he immediately gets up and he starts looking at anthologies and a dictionary of American women writers. And finally he was like, Maria, you, you have found someone who is very new to me. I loved her novels from the get go. She's not really a lovable figure. Mm. And I think that's always in a kind of uh, ornery way drawn me to her. She lived in California. She was born in California. She's the granddaughter of the governor of San Diego now. Oh. What we know about her childhood is that um, she would have been very well educated, probably surpassing what a lot of people, whether they're Latino, not Latino, mm -hmm. would have had at that time. So they were an upper middle class to upper class family. Okay. They own what is now essentially all of San Diego County. Wow. There were just two small, fairly plain ranches on that land. So land rich, but cash poor, but also socially really well connected. A former governor, you've got military commanders in her family. Just like the descendants of European immigrants in America. Exactly, yeah. The California's ancestors came over to 300 years previous and had exactly. been the elite classes ever since. Just like in America. Yeah, so they're very firmly established. You know, we think of the West and the frontier as being this rough and tumble place, but the social calendar in California looks very similar mm. to the social interaction happening on the East Coast. Right, and Europe itself. So she had a, a pretty comfortable upbringing. And then when she was in her teens, the U.S.-Mexico War started. She marries the officer who comes and in, invades San Diego, essentially, and defeats San Diego in the war. Wow. And it seems to really have been a love match. Yeah. They really just seem to have really liked one another. Well, that's begging to be made into a movie. He was rising in the ranks of the military. He had gone out to California as part of the U.S. forces. They hit it off. She was 16 when she married Henry Burton. And she was described as being absolutely beautiful. She's described as beautiful like so often, almost as if she's one of her own heroines. The moon was shining brightly upon the bottom plain. The gentle breeze found lightly the features of the slain. And they can actually talk. And so, you know, there they go. They're, they're getting married and they have her family's blessing. The only hiccup turns out to be that he's Protestant and she's Catholic. It doesn't seem to have been a big deal to them personally, but they did have to ask around and they finally found a Protestant minister who would perform the ceremony. And I think he was criticized afterwards. She cast the look of anguish on dying and on death. Her lap she made a pillow of those who brought a bled. He was 28 when he married her. They stuck together until he died in hmm. 1869. 
He contracted malaria during the Civil War and eventually died of complications. And actually, the story goes that the song we were just listening to, The Maid of Monterey, was based off of Maria Ruiz de Burton's life and her love story with Henry Burton. Wow. So she marries this soldier, and that means she ends up with a foot in both worlds. Yeah. And she travels all over the United States. She lives in Washington, D.C. She lives in New York. Wow. She is really cosmopolitan and really mixing with all different groups of people at high levels. Hmm. He eventually became a brigadier general. So she had an opportunity to meet lots of people. She's doing a lot of traveling. So, of course, her husband is a way of being connected to the real difficulty of being a combatant in that war. She talks about prisoners of war. She was horrified by what the prisoners of war on both sides went through. And she has a character. Uh, who languishes in prison because he's made an enemy of someone in the government who just removes his name from the list of prisoners to be exchanged. So she's in the thick of it. That's one of the things that her marriage allows her. It's almost as if she can be a spy and then write her account of what she sees. And I love that about her. There's really no loyalty to anyone other than the immediate society in which she was raised. She definitely saw herself as Spanish. And this is an interesting distinction that I also think we don't talk about Mm. during this time period, especially that in Mexico, there were two very distinct groups, those who saw themselves as Spanish right. and those who see themselves as Mexican and are seen as racially mixed, whereas the Spanish see themselves as European and as Spanish, right. not as Mexican. They're the conquerors, not the conquered. Exactly. Yeah. It's not that they ignored that they had been born in Mexico, but they're of that level of society that throughout the Spanish colonies would have been called criollo. People who are of Spanish ancestry, but born in the Americas. One of the things Maria Sanchez admires about her that she really understood that all of those very, very clear and very important distinctions were going to be utterly meaningless in America. Ah. And that though she firmly understood herself as Spanish, that Americans are not going to see that. Yeah. There's a a wonderful character. Um, I think it's one of the cackles. It's Mrs. Cackle in Who Would Have Thought It? And she says that she doesn't know what the difference is, Spanish or Mexican, and she doesn't care, quote, they're all horrid. And and that's that's a perfect moment. And that's why I say Ruiz de Burton really understood the new sort of lords of creation weren't going to be bothered with those kinds of social distinctions that had once mattered greatly. I actually feel a little sorry for her, even though I don't think my family ever had anything like that. <laughs> they had a little farm somewhere in Mexico. And now let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is an awesome subscription box that introduces girls age 5 to 10 to real, fearless women who made the world better. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on STEAM activities and more. So when I first heard about these crates, I thought they seemed really cool, but I have to say when my kids got their first crate, I was genuinely amazed at how awesome it was. It really exceeded my expectations. 
But today we're also doing something exciting. Our exciting giveaway extravaganza! <laughs> We are giving away a free Girls Can Crate this month to one of our lucky listeners. For details on how to win, go to whatshernamepodcast.com and click on the giveaway link. The contest ends on April 30th, so make sure you enter right away. What's Your Name believes that real women make the best heroes, and every month, Girls Can Crate delivers them. Girls Can Crate, C-R-A-T-E, dot com, and use the code HERNAME to get 20% off. So she writes these like snarky, critical, I, I can't believe she got away with it, frankly. Yeah. But I think that's one of the, the lessons of her is that you can get away with a lot of really pointed political and social critique if you wrap it up well enough mm. in a romantic, sentimental story. Uh-huh. That's, that's what a lot of 19th century is women writers tried yeah. to do to give you their political views or their social views, but to combine them with a romance, with a, a family drama, almost as if they were adding a little bit of sugar. I mean, Uncle Tom's Cabin is a pretty stringent critique, but there's a lot of family and personal drama and there are characters that you, you love to hate all of these people are reading Uncle Tom's Cabin and they're getting caught up in the story, but they're also being asked to think about the moment in which they live. I think in a lot of ways, regardless of their racial or their ethnic background, women writers had to do that in the 19th century. Right? The novel is made for women in this period because this is how they're gonna get their views into print. You know, I always wonder how much more effective that may have been, you know, the, the people who are never going to read a critique of the Mexican-American War or policy yeah. in the in the new frontier might read this and then start to think about it. Their views have shifted without them being aware that that happened. Exactly. I mean, these are nice people, right? I think in some ways it's just human to say that bad things shouldn't happen to nice people. Yeah. Your reader starts to say, I don't like why these bad things are happening to these nice people. She's not an Emily Dickinson type. Not even a Louisa May Alcott type. I think this is someone who wrote because she had something to say not because she had some kind of burning inner desire to write and to identify herself that way. When I look at somebody like Emily Dickinson, I see someone who knows exactly how good a writer she is. I think Wolf knew exactly how good a writer she was. I don't think Ruiz de Burton had any sense how talented she was. Those novels just sound like your crazy aunt and your crazy aunt who is oddly, absolutely on target about a lot of people and a lot of things. You know, when she describes the family called the Cackles, I mean, first of all, think of that as a name, Cackle. They either wind up getting wonderful things that they are completely undeserving of, like fame and fortune through the Civil War. Or they just wind up being totally okay, right? Nothing touches them. So the people who cackle are the people who win. Maria Risa Burton and Henry Burton bought a ranch in San Diego in the 1850s. And she didn't get a clear title to it until 1889. Wow. She spent literally her entire life fighting for the title to this ranch. Mm. She has only the pension. And this is one of the moments where all the legal battles that are going to be taking place throughout the Southwest between the former Spanish landowners and, let's say, almost everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, this is where they come into play. The Burtons, 
had bought a ranch maybe about 20 miles east of San Diego um, called Hamul Ranch. Um, and they did this in the 1850s. It was 1889 before she got a clear title to it. 10,000 acres of San Diego. Wow. Imagine how much money that is. Yeah. Oh, man. And, and that it just disappeared. Some of that stuff was never recognized. It just got, you know, dismissed after her death. It's really sad. Uh-huh. And and part of me just says, let it go. Yeah. You know, she could have probably lived a pretty comfortable life if she wasn't so fixated on fighting these legal battles. But she just was not going to back down. Uh-huh. This was really important to her. So Maria Sanchez talks about the complicated nature of doing this kind of restorative work. I've thought about that a lot, and I don't want to gloss over, but even if she's not, let's say, tailor-made for the 21st century in terms of her own personal heroism, again, there's this way in which she absolutely refuses to just let the sort of larger tides of history wash over her. Is she fighting on behalf of poor Mexicans? No. (laughs) Is Is she fighting on behalf of people who would now call themselves people of color? Oh, no. But this is someone who in her day is clearly fighting so hard to have her voice heard. I think that alone is admirable. There's this interesting moment in a book that's all about 19th century Mexican-American writing. It's by a wonderful scholar named Genaro Padilla. And he says that he almost didn't write the book. And what he says is he's writing about people whom he thinks would not have let his ancestors into their homes. You know, the kind of people who could write in the 19th century, former Californians, former New Mexicans. They're people like Ruiz de Burton. They had connections. They had the privilege of good educations. And so that early part of American literature that is documenting the experiences of people who were Mexican citizens. It's in the hands of people who, by and large, had some privilege. There are too many women in the 19th century who didn't even get the chance to be that, who didn't get a chance to make even one business venture, who didn't get a chance to travel anywhere, let alone all around the country. And so I think that ought to be honored. Even if I can imagine that today, if she were around, that she might be like my crazy aunt. That is exactly who she would have been. But you just go to Thanksgiving and know that it's gonna be a trip. That's one of the things I love about her. She may not always be nice in how she expresses herself, but she was no fool. She dies in 1895. The last few decades of her life, her life gets increasingly more difficult. She was in Chicago, and she was, at this point, involved in a business endeavor in Mexico itself. It's clear from her letters that she felt very frustrated and often underestimated by the men with whom she was first engaging and then fighting. She became sick in Chicago and she died there. She was only 63. Gastric fever, yes. But reading her correspondence, the level of stress is clear. She's not a happy woman towards the end. There's just, nothing works, nothing goes right and nothing is easy. You know, it's almost as if her life is a novel, up and down and up and down. And at least she got, you know, part of that 
into print so it would live beyond her. These live much larger and they live much longer than a land grant. When some scholars found the books and said, these really need to be brought back into print, you know, they don't need to be translated. They're just sort of ready and waiting for readers. Students can read her and they don't have to actually know a great deal about the historical background and they don't need to know Spanish. It's interesting though, I mean, she didn't really succeed en masse because Americans are still totally oblivious. Yeah, and, and Maria Sanchez says, you know, there's no evidence that her books had any impact whatsoever on the social fabric of America, sadly. You know, that we can look at Uncle Tom's Cabin. That had a profound impact mm, yeah. on Americans' understanding of race, of slavery, of social issues, of all kinds of things. Yeah. And there's, there's no evidence at all that Ruiz de Burton's books did that. In some ways, I, I ask myself, what if Ruiz de Burton had gotten around to writing a little bit sooner? What if those novels had come out right as the war was starting? But 1872, the, the country is just in a different mood. They're burned out. However, now we're finally starting to read these again. You know, I read zero Hispanic literature that I can remember during my undergrad. Yeah. And there definitely wasn't like a class on Hispanic literature or African-American literature or something. Yeah. That's appalling to me. But at the time, it I didn't even question it. And right at that moment is when we're saying, oh, wait a minute. There are other voices that are interesting and worth listening to. And so 15 years later, the entire landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. And there's all of these new things to read and all of these new voices. And it really exciting and kind of groundbreaking shift for me to be able to see that thing happening. Her, her plan didn't work, mm -hmm. but it's working now, maybe. Yeah. Now, a hundred years later, it's shifting the way undergraduates are thinking about immigration, yeah. are thinking about race, are thinking about how we think about race, are thinking about what literature is for, about how you represent the other. Yeah, it could be that there's 50,000 dominoes lined up that you never could pinpoint why the cultural pendulum has swung in a different direction. There are two major schools of thought in history in the field itself. I actually use this as a framework for my world history classes. Hmm. There's great man theory, which hangs history on key individuals. Oh, yeah. Uncle Tom's cabin changed the world. You just hang history on, on pegs of people whose actions changed everything. Right. But there is a complete polar opposite perspective that says none of those individuals changed the world. That no single person ever makes such a profound change that everything changes in the wake of their life. We would call them social historians where they say that history is explained in terms of what the masses are thinking and doing. The tide of culture and it's mm. never one single person that can shift an entire tide. I think I land with our dad and his answer to every question ever, which is... It's both. It's both. <laughs> yeah. So most of my students do land somewhere in between two. And I think that's where it gets interesting because then you can dive deeper. How is it both? In what ways do these yeah. two forces affect each other? And how does social change work? Where are the forces of change coming from? Yeah. So at the end of this semester, a lot of my students will come up with like a recipe. <laughs> They'll say, so you got to have this kind of environment. And then the key individual then mm. does this. And that's how you get social change. We'll never be able to tell a simple story of the past because, you know, the past isn't simple. Just like right. <laughs> now isn't simple. Right. <laughs> I can't even explain what happened today. Maybe if we're going with it's both theory, we needed to set up the dominoes 
for Maria Reese to Burton, and nobody did. Nobody had set up the dominoes yeah. to care. As you're describing the shifts in the literature mm -hmm. syllabi, that is the setting up of the dominoes, I think. Right. The way that our culture collectively decides to teach young people determines the culture of the future. Right. It's the way all of the syllabi in America are shifting. I just wrote a syllabus for migration and diaspora in contemporary women's writing. That hmm. would never have been a class. No. no one would have even thought that that could be a class. Yeah. We weren't reading anything that had been written in the last 20 years. And now you can write a syllabus, which is all books written last year. Mm -hmm. And that that's considered worthy of paying attention to. Yeah. And so everything's shifting around and, and you don't know when the domino is going to fall and where it's going to go and what's going to happen. And that's what's exciting. Yeah. You get excited about how are we going to tell the story <laughs> about 4,000 years ago this year? And I get really excited yeah. about, <laughs> we've only had two African writers that we have read in the last 50 years in America. And maybe this is the year that we start to read 12. <laughs> <laughs> Who will they be? Nobody can tell. <laughs> will it be me that picks the winners? <laughs> it's a bracket. <laughs> awesome. What I'm saying is I'm looking forward and you're looking back. I'm looking forward at people looking back. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm a big believer that eventually word gets out. Even if it's delayed by 100 years, <laughs> word gets out. So, you know, here's an effort to try and get out the word a little bit. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support more episodes of What's Your Name Podcast, please visit our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com and click donate. If you'd like to learn more about Maria Ruiz de Burton, there are pictures, links to her novels, and to Maria Sanchez's wonderful books, and much more information on our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. Music for this episode was provided by Ana Laura Allende, the Earth String Band, Katie Davis Henderson and Fiddlesticks, Mark Nelson, and Jeff Kuno. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would take a minute to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, it makes a huge difference in our ability to reach new listeners and bring you more women making history. This episode was edited by Olivia Mickle, and What's Your Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson.